for those of you I haven't met, uh, my name is Ken. I'm one of the general partners of Electric uh, on the investment team, working a lot on DeFi stuff. Uh, and we have Karn here, uh, who's one of our founders that we work with. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO of a company called RE uh, that is uh, working on tokenizing uh, reinsurance markets. Uh, previously, he was the co-founder and CEO of Cover.com. And prior to that, he's done uh, product work at Shopify, among other things, a bunch of other things. So, um, cool. So I guess maybe uh, a good place to start. Could you give us a quick primer on how reinsurance works? Because I think uh, a lot of people in this in this room might not have a full understanding on on what all goes on there. Yeah. So so reinsurance is uh, insurance for other insurance companies. Uh, we effectively you think about this as like the capital lake that backs the boats that are insurance companies by taking wholesale blocks of risk right off of their balance sheets. Um, and so when we back an insurance company, we're backing hundreds of thousands of policyholders at a time. Auto insurance, home insurance, commercial general liability, workers' compensation, and some of the more interesting stuff around hurricanes, floods, hail, other catastrophic risks is kind of on the way to and, and would you mind sort of talking about how like a like a Lloyd's or like one of these big uh, sort of TradFi reinsurance companies like actually works behind the scenes? Yeah, sure. So so the reinsurance market is about a, a trillion dollar market. Um, Lloyd's is a marketplace within reinsurance that basically connects risk to capital. So you've got insurance companies who are the customers, you have capital providers on one end, and you have specialist underwriters around the world. That are trying to figure out whether they should take risk on, uh, you know, a space launch, a uh, the Golden Gate Bridge falling down, um, uh, you know, hurricanes hitting the coast of South Florida. Uh, but the way that you should think about it is, hey, it's data transfer between an insurance company that sells a, a product, go, finding its way to underwriters and actuaries around the world, who are actually able to assess the risk, and then capital, whether it's Fiat or otherwise flows in to back insurance companies uh, otherwise. Oh, sounds like a DeFi protocol. <laughs> yeah, we still trust at the end of the day. Uh, the whole point of reinsurance is to prove to the world that we're going to be good to make a promise. And that promise is if things hit the fan, uh, you know, we're going to be able to pay out price. It's perfect for DeFi. The whole point of this is prove that you have the capital. Uh, prove what risks you're taking part in. Uh, and prove that you'll be there. Yeah. Cool. Um, I know you sort of had a journey through insurance and ended up in this market. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, sort of that journey and, and why, why you sort of ended up picking reinsurance as a market versus like the primary insurance? Yeah, so, so I mean, the first reason is selfish. Uh, I wanted to make more money, uh, do less work, and build technology uh, in a place where very little technology has been built. Uh, so I built an insurance company over eight years, where we're selling individual policies uh, to retail policyholders, we're selling auto insurance policies and home insurance policies uh, across the world. Sorry, oh, sorry, across the United States, but with capital from around the world. Reinsurance is like one abstraction layer away from a traditional insurance company. It is uh, a much bigger pool of capital. It's way more diversified. It gets to scale dramatically faster, and it fundamentally is a coordination problem uh, amongst a bunch of different actors that need to have the same view of data uh, that isn't around the risks that we back and the capital we have to back those risks at any given point in time. Um, so reinsurance is actually one of the perfect use cases uh, of transforming an insurance contract, uh, sorry, an insurance, traditional insurance contract into a reinsurance contract. A regulator can now trivially look up exactly how much cash we have, what risk we're party to. Um, we do effectively the work of the regulator for them by, uh, by giving them a real-time continuous audit. Yeah, so that kind of that kind of relates to my next question. Like, what what about sort of blockchain or tokenization, you know, did you find really interesting? Because you went in this, this is not necessarily a, a blockchain company, right? Like, um, and so, you know, what, what, what about this kind of technology stack is really interesting for this particular yeah, type so, of business. So, um, you know, if, if real world assets really take off, what you're going to see is a global capital layer. You're going to see global capital formation that can back all real world economic activity. Um, and you can do it in a super transparent way, in a, in a way that folks can observe and trust, uh, and in a way that enables a whole bunch of really unique things about this technology that otherwise just wouldn't be possible 
uh, in a place where most of the business is done back in the adult math, you know, over cups of brown liquor, um, you know, and spreadsheets being shared between people. So, you know, uh, transparency begets trust, trust begets liquidity, um, and all of a sudden you can have all sorts of new capital that, that forms to back insurance companies around the world. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, how do you think about, so, you know, I, there's, there's, in the last kind of two years, we've had almost every type of real world asset imaginable uh, come on chain. And, you know, one of the questions I've always had is like, who, who on the on-chain side actually wants this stuff um, and why? And so I'm kind of curious how you think about that side of it, the demand side of this. Yeah, so, so for us, it would be two distinct sets of customers, right? Um, there's a set of customers that want really quick turnaround on making money on their money. And so, you know, betting on whether or not a hurricane hits South Florida is probably up their alley. Uh, there are also folks that want to earn, a, you know, 25% yield. Uh, that's like high yield fixed income type of return that's not fully crypto, but it's predicated on hundreds of thousands, millions of policyholders around the world paying you returns, premiums, for putting your capital at risk. Um, so very distinct. So, you know, one is one is definitely oriented towards institutions. Uh, one is oriented a little bit towards institutions, and certainly maybe a little bit more like retail. Uh, yeah. And and do you think like the on-chain rails are like? Do you think there's a, a set of folks that are on-chain that like sort of don't have access to this traditionally? Like, how do you think about? Yeah. This, this is one of the most opaque markets in the world, right? You have nearly a trillion in reinsurance capital that's locked up. You have multiples of that amongst all the primary insurance companies in the world locked up. Um, capital is fungible, it's not special, right? It requires a, a return, um, uh, an expected return given a variance of potential returns. Um, and you can, de you can effectively decompose the reinsurer or an insurance company into the people that do the work, uh, that do the work to price risk, to understand risk, and the capital that ultimately backs them. You know, coordinating on chain helps you do things like build reputation, build an understanding of what tra a track record is, build uh, an understanding of whether or not the counterparty um, has acted in a fraudulent way in the past. There are a lot of really smart people in this space, but there are a lot of real criminals as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these things that gets rid of that, and it's actually why regulators do the Interesting. Yeah, I, I could see it really changing the kind of the game theory around how you interact with this market. Um, Another sort of like thing that comes up a lot with RWA is obviously sort of the regulatory side. You know, I, I know reinsurance and insurance markets in general are like quite heavily regulated. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, how, what has your experience been sort of navigating the regulatory side of this business, and especially as you look to the blockchain? So, so we operate a regulated, I think it's like we, we own a commercial general reinsurer. We have the ability to take risk off the balance sheet of any insurance company on earth that is not on our OPAC list. Um, the pitch to a regulator, it, you really just need to understand what their incentives are, right? A regulator is there to make sure that uh, you, you can remain solvent, right? That if things hit the fan, you've got the money. Uh, and, and the other piece is basically you're not ripping the faces off of the end customer. And especially, specifically in insurance, um, there can be the opportunity if you, uh, to discriminate on the basis of, of underwriting. So they, they step in uh, to be able to prevent those types of things. So, you know, our, our path to pitching an on-chain reinsurer centered around, hey, we are now building a reinsurer that's open kimono. You can, you can see who our counterparties are. You can see how we've conducted every single transaction. You can see what capital is backing a given transaction, and you have an interface to be able to handle that. There's no reinsurer on earth, Unicree, Swiss Re, what have you, that is tooled in a way that eliminates that you know that type of that type of counterparty risk, um, and so if you do it right, you've made the job of the regulator easier. They love hearing that. You've also reduced a ton of systemic risk and a ton. Of, you've taken a ton of administrative cost out of handling the transaction as well, which is what they love too, because it ends up getting passed yeah. back to the policy. Yeah. Why do you why do you think sort of the existing reinsurance market hasn't converged at this at this kind of greater place of transparency today? Everything, every one of the traditional finance ecosystems hits an equilibrium around cost structure um, over time. Uh, you, you have the introduction of intermediaries, 
that extract economics, that make themselves systemically important. Um, you have you have individuals with a vested interest to not adopt wholesale new technologies. Take the perspective. Let's just say you know you you have the largest reinsurer in the world. Imagine the CTO of that reinsurer going to their board and pitching. We are now going to turn every insurance treaty and contract with every other insurance company in the world that we're, we're party to into a smart contract that tells the world what we pay them, what risks are, uh, what's on risk, and how much capital is backing that risk. The lift from a technology perspective would be absolutely insane, and it would actually take economics off the table for them because you're, you're driving efficiency. The board will look at that and they would say, no way, Jose, we run a very profitable business that's compounding, or we've got a ton of regulatory capture, why would we even entertain this? And so, you know, there are systemic reasons, there's regulatory capture. Um, these are monoliths that print money, right? Um, and so there, there isn't a natural incentive for them to do anything here. Yeah, I mean, it sounds, sounds about standard fare for, for TriFi. Um, I guess like thinking beyond, you know, even, even what you guys are building, how do you think that uh, tokenization and blockchain affect kind of the insurance business overall going forward? So, so what I what I'm most excited about um, is if we if we actually pull off tokenizing a ton of new real world assets, um, uranium, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, fine art, Taylor Swift's uh, entire content library, you, it's now in a format that can be used as insurance collateral to back real world economic activity. Right. So if you think about what the collateral pool is for a traditional insurer. It's going to be some combination of cash, equities, fixed income. There is a world in the future where certainly you can have a, like a working capital layer that pays claims in fiat or USDC, but there is going to be a global capital layer of crypto assets that can be accessed and is observable by any counterparty to, have, to, to basically push the idea of, hey, if everything goes awry, you now have this liquid pool that can be accessed in a way that doesn't that doesn't exist. So you you have a diversity of assets with different liquidity profiles um, that can now be used as insurance collateral, which is really really. Do you think that leads to like more more types of things being covered or or more access for insurance in general? Like, what do you think that sort of the downstream effect of that is? Yes. Yeah, so, so the real world. Uh, there's tons of premium, right? We we saw six billion in premium flow uh, in deal flow last year, and we're a startup reinsurance market, right? So we saw eight percent of uh, of the specialist insurance space. There's a trillion that we can look at, uh, and really just capacity constrained to be able to, from, from a capital perspective, to be able to access that. I think eventually there's going to be a convergence between all of these off-chain risks and on-chain risks. The right set of steps is probably for an entity like us to get quite big, um, build a multi-billion dollar book, and segue into native risks, which, which much, you know, if you think about how they actually perform, they perform much more like catastrophic risks. Hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, things that, that are long tail and very, very difficult to predict. Um, and so it would demand a, a pretty significant risk premium. So is, is that is that sort of how you imagine like re will, will go once you sort of figure out the, the initial stuff to reinsurance market? I, I think so. I, I think we want to prove that we can deliver a significant return. I want to prove that we can get to a multi-billion dollar book of business in a couple of years without blowing ourselves up. Uh, I, I want to I want to build out the, the plumbing and the rails that make us accessible to native on-chain risks. And I want to see um, Quite frankly, uh, as an insurance-ish person, the data that helps us figure out how to price it into underwriting. Um, what do you What do you think are the implications of uh, sort of the governance side of this? So you know, clearly, like private companies or or pretty opaque organizations today. You know, what what do you think changes in the world when when the decisions that we make around uh, how insurance markets run suddenly are sort of decentralized and represents a potentially a much broader uh, set of viewpoints. So, uh, Avishal said something to me the other night that resonated really well. 
And that, and that was that governments are insurance companies, therefore network states are insurance companies. What I would hope for a, a decentralized reinsurer or insurance company is for it to be systemically important, right? I want to decouple the capital from the people that generate the alpha and do the underwriting. And I want unique things to bootstrap off of what could be a $100 billion collateral loan. If, if, we, if we absorb all of reinsurance, we're talking about a trillion of capital. If we, all, if we absorb all of primary insurance, we're talking about four trillion in capital. That's enough money, that's enough collateral, that's enough promise to bootstrap currencies and all sorts of other economic, economic activity off of a global capital wave. So while, while it may seem really unsexy, simply from having the cash to prove that you can fulfill promises like a government does by fulfilling the promise of protecting property rights, it can get really, really interesting and really, really zany if you think about this in a way. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think there are sort of um, core misalignments in sort of today's insurance industry because, because this stuff is sort of more private and... So the, the, the identities are arbitrage, you think, right? Um, if you have a governance structure and you have transparency around how risks are back and capital backs them, there's no reason why some sophisticated actor somewhere in the world couldn't have a say in how this entity is run. Like, if, if you really want to drive the cost of these transactions, you want to drive insurance costs down, you want to make capacity available, um, then decomposing the insurance market is the answer. And the way that you have a say in the investment policy of this lateral pool, in what lines of business are acceptable, what new lines of business are interesting, is to vote right on it with your money. Um, and it's to put that capital at risk uh, and to be rewarded if you're right and to, and to be in a position to suffer a loss if you're wrong. Uh, so, so my viewpoint on this is insurance and reinsurance are actually just public facilities. Um, if you think about them in, a, in an abstract way, and that serves, it actually serves really well uh, if you wrap this thing in a DAO or, you know, or something like that. Makes sense. Um, I'm curious as you look at the, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've done a lot of research on some of the on chain uh, insurance stuff that, that we've seen so far. I'm curious to kind of get your perspective on like, you know, what, what are the things that sort of existing on-chain stuff has gotten right? And like, what's kind of missing in that world? Because I, I know we're like relatively early there. Yeah, so I spent eight years building an insurance company, right? Um, I think I have a pretty good handle on, on what risks, uh, risk and risk pricing. I would say the on-chain people are braver than I am, right? I think Nexus Mutual, Ether Risk folks, Sherlock, They've all, you know, some of them are doing the work, some of them are not. They've all been directionally correct. Um, I, I don't think they got the timing right. right. Um, and so when you think about native products that secure against smart contract cover or other catastrophic events on chain, um, the, the unfortunate part is the risk is real, but the price to cover the risk is maybe something the market won't bear, right? And, the easiest way to determine that is to see actually how much premium has been generated to cover off these risks. And so you've had you know a couple hundred million, maybe a billion in capital form on chain for these on-chain folks, but you have 10, 20 million in premium. It's actually a relatively inefficient use of capital. Um, I actually, so I do think though, they are directly correct and that there will be a convergence. It will just happen, it'll be a matter of time before it happens. And the folks that stick it out will, will do well. Do you think? Do you think that's like a? Is it a? Is it a maturity in the modeling and the pricing, or is it like a scale, or maybe both? It's, it's a wild west. Yeah. So we we just don't know what we don't know, uh, and there isn't a time series of data for us to be able to model what we think the losses are going to be from a severity perspective or a frequency perspective. So part of this is a function of time. Part of this is just seeing who loses money and how much um, before you can come to a premium um, and you can pool the risk uh, uh, and get a diversification benefit from pooling the risk. 
again, I think it's an inevitable thing. Um, but it is, it is either you're going to lose a lot of money doing it, or you're going to generate an incredible amount of alpha by being one of the first movers. Um, I just don't think the market is there yet, but we're, we're, we're literally just years away. Yeah. Are there, are there any parallels from uh, sort of non-crypto related stuff in your insurance markets that sort of ha had to go through the same learning period? All of DeFi is just on a really fast track to replicate everything that's blown up in TradFi in the last 200 years, right? Um, I, you know, you, we've seen examples of, you know, what you would call, um, you know, systemic leverage playing out. We've seen examples of fraud playing out. Um, we've seen examples of growing for the sake of growing without recognizing that you actually don't know what your cost of the sold is when you're in a risk business. Lending protocols, at least the initial versions of them, were adversely selected against. They got really, really crappy risks um, that offered really high yields, but you had compensated with a high yield uh, because it's a, a potentially a, a crappy risk. And you've seen people that have duration uh, matched poorly. Um, very few people that have thought about what LTV to CAC dynamics look like for originating business um, and ultimately like serving that business. Many of the things that have played out in, in FinTech um, and before that, TradFi will play out in crypto. It's just going to happen at a lightning fast pace. Um, and and the, good, the good part is that it happens at a really, really fast pace. The bad part of it is that because it happens so fast, it makes the headlines. Um, and, and we, you know, we get shit on for it. And so a, good, a very good example of that in reinsurance would be um, over the last six months, we had a, a Web2 competitor investor go bankrupt for misrepresenting $4 billion in collateral, backing nearly probably something like $12 billion in premium, um, by simply forging letters of credit with a bank. So you can imagine, I, I mentioned earlier, like a lot of this business is done back of the envelope math, Excel spreadsheets and PDFs that are swapped between analysts. Imagine forging $4 billion in collateral by modifying, modifying a PDF. Um, and imagine the damage that is, is caused the ultimate policyholder as a result of that. If you move this stuff on chain, there's no chance this happens, right? Um, it just becomes resilient to, to all of these bad actors. Do you think that, uh, does that end up in essentially a repricing of all this stuff? Like will, will on-chain insurance or blockchain powered insurance be cheaper than insurance that we have today? I think, I think we can drive cost out of transaction and we can incentive align underwriters and actuaries around the world to price risk better because they have some skin in the game. Even a two, three point differential across a trillion dollar market is a massive number, right? Um, and so if you think about behavior change in insurance or other trad pie markets, you know, they're not afraid of any of this. And so money talks, right? So if we drive cost out, we can pay the, the insurance companies, the originators of this risk, the ones that we take risk off of, more money. If we pay them more money, they can either lower rates for their policyholders or they make more money and they substitute towards us as the market of choice. Um, that happens really quickly, right? But it happens, it happens when you hit a critical mass of scale. That's actually related to the next question I was going to ask is, how do you how do you think about you know um, the, the evolution of, of you know so we're, we're sort of just getting started with the on chain stuff, um, and obviously we've had hundreds of years of experience on the off chain side. Like, how do how do you see this evolving going forward? Like, you know, we we have you know we're not we're not starting from a clean slate. Um, we're the, the existing players are going to have to evolve somehow. So how, how do you see that playing out going forward? Um, so, so there are probably people in this room that are like me that don't believe in behavior change. Is there a, and so if you make a lot of money running a traditional financial institution, you're unlikely uh, to put your, your uh, skin or your neck out to do something that's fundamentally different. 
<laughs> I think what is, what is going to end up happening is that we're going to show that we can be more profitable. We're going to have a ton of operating leverage around what we do. And it's going to be very, very difficult to ignore. Um, it's just going to be, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, you just need to scale. And once you've got some scale, and you've got a cost structure that beats theirs. The competitive response is to do everything you can uh, to clamor and do everything you can to implement the same technology or try to do something to catch up. Um, what, in terms of uh, you know the, the experience that you've had building Re so far, you know what what do you think? Uh, you know, I, obviously you guys are pretty a little bit early in your journey, but like, are, are there any lessons that you think apply to kind of you know RWAs in general, and 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 uh, you know what what can lead to success there? Sure. Um, so, so we're special because there's the special technology that we're using to deliver new products. But the math is always going to be the math, right? Um, and so if you don't assess credit risk, if you don't assess underwriting risk, if you don't think about duration, if you don't think about payback period, um, all the basic tenets of building a financial institution but on chain still apply, right? And I, and I think... This is, not, this is not necessarily even a lesson just for people who are building in our space. We've seen, we saw a massive implosion of fintechs and insurtechs over the last two years are just incredibly cash burning, grew for the sake of growing, uh, to, to show top line growth, but didn't really think about how, how to evolve their economic models um, as things got hairy, and they did get hairy, right? So if there's a lesson here, it is like, Know every lever of your business. Know what you need to do to be default alive. Know, at least know what the major macro risks are. Um, and I think you can, you can probably weather the storm. Right? I, I think it really comes down to when people get greedy and they want to grow too fast and they take on risks that don't make any sense, or they do things that they, you know, deep down inside, know they're doing for the sake of raising another round or, uh, you know, uh, showcasing significant growth, uh, you know, that's going to come back to roost, right? And so we saw a whole, a whole slew of these companies go to zero. We saw a whole slew of these companies trade down to negative enterprise value, less than the cash on their balance sheets. I don't think that RW projects are going to be immune from that, right? And so you got to get the fundamentals right. If you don't get the fundamentals right, you should do something else. Unit economics, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, um, what are you, uh, you know, what are you excited about in the RWA space in general? Like, sort of outside of insurance, like other things that you see happening out there. Like, what, what, what do you think is the most exciting right now? So, so my my general belief is that if you can model a financial product, it's going to make its way on chain. Right? Basically, any scarce goods, all scarce content. Is, is going to end up tokenized. And, it, and I think it's, gonna, it's not going to be a one-way street, right? Like the tokenization for the sake of tokenization is nice. But the beauty, the beauty of the tokenization is now you have, you have these assets that are slightly more liquid. They're observable. They're swappable into other, they're swappable into other assets. And they can be used for all sorts of unique and interesting purposes, right? There's a world now where if you... If you have a DAO with a significantly sized treasury that you know perhaps holds some RWA related tokens or assets or native you know, native tokens or USDC. There there will be a compliant way where you can shard some part of that treasury and turn it into insurance collateral to back real world economic activity. That is insane. That that is insane. Now all of, all of a sudden you have a huge amount of new capital flowing into a space that traditionally has spun off a huge amount of profit. You're now bringing capital into the ecosystem. It becomes a two-way street as opposed to a one-way street, which I think 
is going to play out, and it's going to be amazing to see. Cool. Um, I think that's sort of the set of questions I had uh, for you lined up. Um, we wanted to do like maybe like a 10 minutes of Q&A in case anyone had uh, questions for Karn here. Pickle shots. <laughs> so the question is why why should everyone in the room sort of be interested in, in this? Yeah. I I think uh, if we want to win, we're gonna have to come up with use cases for this underlying infrastructure that we've been iterating on for the last couple of years. And this is, this is one of the ways that you bring hundreds of billions in value on chain that is distinct from natively trained economics amongst one another. It is, it is a singular bridge to connect real world economic activity to a beautiful piece of technology, a beautiful set of technology. Um, and so whenever, whenever we're criticized as an industry that we're, we're a bunch of smart people building really unique technology without a use case, at the application layer, we need to be thinking about how do we have this, have this value. And it's, not, it's going to be some combination of the really boring, unsexy stuff and some combination of really sexy consumer stuff that makes this happen. But you need to drive cash into the ecosystem. Um, that's why I think this is important. Makes sense. Real, real use cases, right? Not, not all of them are sexy, but uh, they're really important. Cool. Um, I think that's, uh, that's all the questions that I had. Thanks for, uh, thanks for showing up and uh, talking with us. And uh, hopefully it was interesting for, for everyone here.